All right, welcome back to the second day of class in empirical methods. Uh, thank you to those of you who have already responded to my request for permission to record and publish these, uh, well, lectures. Um, I realized there was a specification flaw in my message. So now for those of you that have yet to respond, I don't know if that means that you would rather or I don't include you in the recording or you disagree with the recording in the first place or just that you have yet to respond. I don't know which one of those to infer. So if you wouldn't mind, please responding anyway and telling me no. Uh, so this way, at least I can know that, you know, which one of the two meanings to, uh, uh, to ascribe to this. Um, okay, so today I wanted to finish up the uh, discussion we started last week with a little bit of the overview of the class. Uh, hopefully, if I haven't convinced you yet, uh, I will I'll try to do that now to, to stick around for the rest of the semester um, and talk about a new topic. So what I'd like to do is, you know, we talked a lot about methods and talked about some examples of methods and studies, uh, but I didn't really say much about what this class is going to be about, other than to say that we're going to learn about all these things, but really not more specifically than this. So let me say a little bit more about the class uh, uh, itself, right? So this was, this was the summary. This is where we left off. We talked about how all of these methods are useful, but probably limited in their own ways. Um, and one does not randomly choose a research method for a particular study or research question, but rather does that in a sort of principled way, depending on lots of these assumptions that one makes about science and the world and uh, other, uh, other criteria. Um, so, okay, so just to clarify a few things, this class is specifically not about software engineering. Um, so even though you will probably yourselves are, many of you are software engineering researchers. And even though we will have a bunch of readings, including we had a couple of readings for today that were software engineering papers, it is not at all the focus of this class. And uh, it is for all purposes, I think, uh, entirely relevant what the domain is. Um, there will be lots of readings from software engineering because I'm familiar with this literature uh, and because lots of you are working in this, but really this class is designed to be uh, more general than that. Um, and you know, it's really fundamentally a science class. You could think of this as relevant to any discipline within CS or otherwise. It's really not about software engineering despite some of the, the readings. Uh, so that's point, point one. Uh, point two, this class is you know, not about communication, but it is secretly about communication because we'll be doing a lot of practice communicating research, both uh, orally and in writing. We will practice, you will practice articulating a, what a particular problem is and why it's important that anybody think about that problem and your vision and plan for how to solve it and, and what your results are and so on and so forth. And we'll do this in a variety of ways throughout the semester. Uh, with blog posts, with oral presentations, with a write-up at the very end, and, and a bunch of other things like this. Um, and you know, I really cannot emphasize this enough. It's often an overlooked aspect, especially in technical fields like software engineering or CS more broadly, but how important communication of research results of science is in any field, but especially in these technical ones where people tend to overlook this. Um, because, and you know, I guess the reality or a reality of the world we live in is that regardless of how brilliant your science and research will be, if you are unable to communicate that brilliance to others through, you know, clever uh, writing and, and speaking and all of this at conferences and, and papers, et cetera, et cetera, um, it will be very hard to have impact with this work. And that's probably something you all care about, you know, having impact with uh, your work. Uh, so really, you know, by practicing all of these things, uh, I'm hoping to give you more exposure to uh, communication in general. Um, we'll also, you know, it's not about peer review, but it is secretly about peer review because we will be critiquing and thinking very deeply about tons and tons of 
research papers that uh, others have done. We will be critiquing each other's proposals and ideas uh, throughout. Um, so we'll be practicing all of these skills that are relevant during peer review. Like you will, you know, in many ways, uh, act as peer reviewers for uh, all of these research papers that we will be dissecting and critiquing and, and trying to, to think about throughout the semester. Um, and, you know, finally, I, I'm, I guess I started with this, what I'm really hoping to give you with this class is a healthy dose of skepticism that will uh, stick with you for the rest of your lives and careers uh, if, if you don't have it already. Um, and um, I'm, I'm confident that a class like this can do that because these research methods that we're learning about and issues of rigor and validity and appropriateness of evidence given claims or the other way around, um, all of these issues are fundamentally the same across all of science in you know, study designs and experiments and analyses and data and, and all of that is always the same. Um, so, you know, if you're learning how to think critically about empirical science and research in your particular area, which is probably what you'll be doing first, that will also expose you to thinking more critically about science in any area. So, you know, you will hopefully have more informed views on anything and everything uh, after learning more about the methods. So you can read papers on, I don't know, uh, COVID vaccines or climate change or what have you, you know, whatever the topic might be, you'll be able to think critically about, you know, the science in these other domains. And so how rigorous and valid and trustworthy it is. So that's really what I'm hoping to, to give you with this class more than, more than anything uh, uh, at all. Um, okay. Oh yeah. Just as a as an anecdote, does anybody know Ian? This other one. This was a student uh, that took the class a few years ago, um, and uh, hated parts of uh, the, the material and was very open about it. Uh, and then graduated and wrote me a super nice email at some point later about how you know, hey, you remember all those things I hated when I was taking your class. As it turns out, they, uh, you know, were actually useful and relevant, you know, for my uh, daily job once I graduated. So um, I, I welcome and encourage you to be skeptical of all these things, and you know, keep me on my toes and, and question everything I say throughout all of this. Uh, and you know, maybe years later, uh, I'm lucky enough to get an email saying that some of this was useful, uh, or you know, rotten tomatoes, whichever. So is that going to be relevant? That is anecdotal evidence. Yes, very good. It must be true in general. Excellent. Um, okay, so this is a rough plan. I've tried to color code kind of similar sets of topics. This is a rough plan. It will likely change, but uh, we'll, we'll give you an Im impression of the distribution of topics. Um, we will continue this discussion in the beginning of the semester, thinking about these higher level issues of you know how do you formulate research questions how do you think about what a gap in the literature is and how do you articulate that so that you can you know contribute to filling it um, how do you think about theory where does that fit into this um, we're gonna probably start with qualitative research methods very soon thinking about interviews and surveys and how to design them and, and all of that um, the Proposals are probably also coming up soon. So we will, uh, you know, the, the sooner we start working on the actual research projects, the more likely that we will succeed in, you know, getting to some results by the end. So you know, we're, we're trying to do this as early as possible. Um, and then we're gonna have a section on causality and designs that allow one to test for causality, various forms of experiments. Um, we will step down a little bit from this and uh, think about you know, observational studies based on data of various forms of quantitative analyses, regressions, time to use analysis, things like that. Um, again, kind of trying to get closer to causality, uh, except without running experiments from these quasi-experimental conditions. Um, we're going to talk about social network analysis at some point uh, because it's really interesting and actually uh, 
relevant to lots of areas of uh, science and the world, not just to social media. Um, and we're going to have a couple of interesting uh, sessions at the end where we talk about some uh, dramatic papers where, you know, scandals, if you will, in computer science research, I don't know, uh, failed replications and things like that and the drama around them. Uh, and, and that was always fun when we did that in the past. Uh, and we will end with final presentations of your research projects. Um, so I guess we have to sort of figure out how we're going to do this, but typically in the past, we have reserved the last two lectures for final presentations. Uh, and as you know, there's no exam for the class. Okay, so the grade is made up of the project work and the homework assignments and participation. So there's no exam. One thing that's important, maybe two things that are important that I forgot to mention, or I mentioned very briefly last time. One is, um, you are welcome to do both the actual research projects, the final projects, as well as the homework assignments throughout the semester. You're welcome to do them in pairs if you so choose. Um, you're also welcome not to do them in pairs if you don't want to, but you're welcome to do them in pairs if you'd like. Uh, all I ask is that, especially for the final report, you know, in indicate clearly uh, uh, who contributed what to that project uh, and, and the write-up. Uh, and that, you know, I ask that you uh, both contribute meaningfully to the work that the team does. Um, that's one. The other, I mentioned uh, last time that um, I would like you to think about mixed methods research projects for these final research projects. Um, and uh, Bobo, complain afterwards that, uh, you know, what if, even though Bobo, you were the one that proposed this in the first place. So it's a little, <laughs> a little odd for you to complain. Anyway, um, Bobo complained that, um, you know, there's a bunch of logistical hurdles to conducting human subjects research. Uh, for example, the IRB process at CMU, which, you know, takes some time. Uh, it's not insurmountable but it's some extra time that you sort of factor in during which you will uh, likely not be able to, you know, make a lot of progress on these actual human subject studies, right, before you get reviewed and approved by the IRB. Um, so, you know, if, if that applies to you, uh, you know, we should, we should think about how to overcome this. Um, and also, so, you know, so please talk to me, right? If, if that's the case, please talk to me. We'll, uh, we'll think of something. Um, also, the other thing, um, I realize that you know, it's ambitious to be able to start and finish a, you know, a full research project uh, within the scope of one class that spans one semester. Uh, a research project that necessarily uh, involves, you know, a quantitative component, say, and a qualitative component or an experiment and something else. Um, so, you know, if that's the case, if the plan is too ambitious and it's just really infeasible, again, please, please talk to me. What I'd like to see as part of the final report is at least this, you know, um, design of the second component of this mixed methods plan. You know, and, and even if you don't get to fully finish the second one, I, I still want to see that you've thought about how you would design this. You know, if, if say the second component is some data analysis, I want I want to see the plan for how you would collect and analyze the data, even if you haven't done that yet. If the second component is some I don't know interview study, I want to see the interview protocol and the sampling strategy and these kinds of things for you know how you will select participants, what you will ask them, etc. Right. So I would like to see those as part of the final report. Um, uh, you know, that happens to be your second method. Uh, and I will probably understand that you haven't been able to carry out that work just yet. Um, it's also possible, uh, last thing I'll mention on this, you know, it's possible that this is work that would typically, uh, that could go beyond the scope of any single paper that you might submit. Uh, so that's also okay, you know, the. Um, Oftentimes, we think about research programs more broadly than any individual papers. You know, for example, when you're 
uh, I don't know, hired to be a tenure track faculty somewhere, you're expected to, I don't know, have this research program that will last you know, years and will keep a bunch of uh, uh, PhD students busy for a long time. And, you know, it's, it's, it's always designed to be broader scope than just any individual paper. Uh, so that's okay, right? So it's okay if it's broader. It's okay if you don't end up doing it all in one paper. But I want to see how you would think about this. And I want to see how uh, mixing research methods would enrich and add value to your own research programs. That's kind of the, the, the flavor of this. Okay. So I'll pause for a second for questions. This is all leftover stuff from, uh, from last time. Is there anything? Courtney. No, I was wondering, so if we are doing, like if our current project doesn't make sense to be mixed methods, so we're going to do like a separate project for this class, and we like are going to do a qualitative thing, like an interview or survey, like historically, do we have to get our review approval for it if it's a class project? Okay, so uh, two, two parts to your question. Um, you know, if part one, if the... I don't know, some component of the study uh, doesn't make sense. Should I still include it just to take the box? No, uh, we should think together of projects or programs, research programs that make sense and add value. Okay, so I, I don't want anybody to waste their time inventing fake studies for the purpose of taking a box for this class. I want you to spend your time thinking productively about really how you know, these other kinds of methods would enrich your research programs, even if beyond the scope of, you know, the paper you're currently working on, but maybe the next paper, right, or the one after that. But I, I want to see something valuable to you personally, to each of you. Uh, and the second question is, um, if, uh, uh, you know, if we do, I don't know, human subjects style research as part of this class, do we still need IRB? Um, in well, yes and no, this is a subtle question. Um, if we're doing it just as a class homework assignment, which we will we'll have, you know, for example, an interview uh, homework assignment at some points. Um, if we are doing it as a purely class homework assignment, we do not. But the thing I've been trying to encourage you all to do is to use an opportunity to take this class to actually help with your actual research projects. I would like the projects you do for this class to not be made up projects for this class, but to be things that you're actually working on anyway. Uh, so in that case, you know, if you're actually working on those research projects, they probably go beyond the scope of class projects uh, and they enter the scope of IRB. Uh, so, you know, that's why there's this, uh, I don't know, subtlety with the RB versus no RB. Uh, because I'm insisting, well, I, I think it's more valuable to you all to do projects that actually make sense for your own research rather than to invent projects just for the sake of the class. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I'd, I'd rather help you, you know, go through IRB than uh, just make up projects. IRB also expedites things for course projects. Yeah, so I think we have, we have options. Okay, anything else? And I don't know if I can see folks on Zoom. No questions on Zoom, I think. Okay, so now let me move on to the second part of this. Oh, well, that's not useful. Okay, that's better. All right. Yeah, is my screen still shared and all that? Folks on Zoom? Yes, that's I'm great. taking that as a yes. Yes, it sounds like hopefully that's uh, still the case. Where's the there? Okay, so I want to talk about research questions today and so how to think a little bit about the research questions you're asking and how maybe this is sometimes more subtle than you might uh, think at, at first glance. 
Um, and we're also going to talk about the uh, discussion posts. Thank you to those of you that have posted responses to the discussion posts. I saw some really good comments in there uh, and a few comments that really stood out as uh, good reasons to take this class. I want to touch on those in a, in a minute too. Um, okay, and if we have time, maybe we'll do an activity at the end. So let's talk about the readings a little bit. Uh, I've asked you all to skim through two papers. Uh, they were these papers. There was a how to break an API, cost negotiation and community values in three software ecosystems. Um, and there was a semantic versioning versus breaking changes, a study of the Maven repository. And I've asked you to think about a number of questions and be prepared to discuss them. What is the point of the paper? What is the methodology? Why did they choose that, the authors? Uh, and whether you trust the results uh, and why or why not? Why might you be misled? Uh, you know, how do you evaluate studies like these? Uh, and a trick question in there about generalizability, about what does the, this particular study tell you about other ecosystems, other contexts. Okay. So let's talk about this a little bit. Uh, I, let's have a discussion. I guess let's start with, uh, yeah, let me start with uh, what's the point? What anybody, can anybody remind us what, you know, each of these papers was roughly about somebody that has thought about this. Uh, let's just have a chance to read. Yes. The first paper is um, studying decentralized software systems and analyzing all the core values of these and influence how developers respond to break things. Uh -huh. um, essentially saying that the Burden of responsibility um, and the general approach depends on the sense of value. Um, and the second one was given these all, uh, principles of semantic versioning, looking back over seven years of history, are developers actually following those? Things? Just have okay, okay, yeah, thank you. So you'll see, or uh, sort of try to summarize this in a, in a second differently for folks on Zoom if uh, it wasn't loud enough. Um, you see uh, very different kinds of research questions being asked. Uh, if, when I thought about this, um, you know, I saw on the one hand in the ecosystems, three ecosystems paper, I saw this quest to uh, describe and understand the state of practice in some field. Um, and uh, by design, this desire to compare and contrast these three different environments, these three different ecosystems. Uh, but really, I think the key element to me, to me when I was reading these, a key element to this first paper was that they were essentially looking for these theoretical relationships, the researchers, um, between the values that people held in those communities and the practices they uh, followed or uh, implemented. So, you know, like how, it was basically a study on how uh, what people believe might explain their observed actions in terms of the, these practices for uh, managing breaking changes and so on. All right. So, if you think about it a little bit, um, uh, it tries to get at this. So inner causal mechanism. They didn't do that explicitly, but so that's what I was reading into this implicitly, right? They were talking about how people's beliefs might explain their actions. And furthermore, they uh, compared three environments um, where you know, they suspected uh, that people's beliefs and actions might be meaningfully different for some reasons they articulate. Okay, so that was really interesting. And so they didn't select, you know, one particular environment to study, but multiple. Um, and they had a very principled 
approach to choosing those, right? They chose the three in, in this case um, because they had some interestingly different properties, the three, that uh, made the researchers suspect that you know, people's values and uh, beliefs and actions might somehow be different. Okay, so there were so two things in one here. One is this, you know, trying to understand this relationship between beliefs and actions, but also by comparing and contrasting these different environments, you know, seeing how that varies, you know, with these other contextual factors. So there was a lot, there was a lot of um, this maybe to a theoretical thinking in this. What was the other paper? Tell me again. Yeah. So the other paper was given a set of principles that are advertised about a given practice, so semantic version of is that practice actually being followed? Uh -huh. Right. So this is a very common style of research question that you will see a lot uh, in you know in our field and other fields. You know, uh, given X, how prevalent is it? Right in the wild, we have this practice or this tool that people are using or whatever you know how often do people do this kind of thing in the wild right it's often a meaningful interesting thing to ask like how prevalent is something anything you know do people actually how often do people use a password manager you know in the wild right how often do people do anything in the wild right you know often we have a lot of i don't know best practices when it comes to everything right and we're curious to see how often people actually follow them how often do they implement them that's a very valid very commonly encountered kind of research question um, uh, so you know they went and they tried to collect evidence from this one ecosystem uh, to see how common this particular practice was um, and furthermore they looked for some statistical relationships between two particular practices there, right? They were looking at the relationship between uh, semantic versioning on the one hand and breaking changes on the other hand, right? So you know, they had some reason to suspect that there might be some causal relationship between those, right? You know, for example, they suspected that, I don't know, there should be less uh, uh, breaking changes when people adhere to semantic versioning more strictly, and things like that. Um, and so they had this maybe you know hypothesis or some underlying theory, and they went and looked for data to support or refute that, right? In the wild, to see if that happens to to hold, right? So very different style of studies, right? And, and also very different kinds of research questions they're asking. Let's go one further. Um, how did they do it? So the uh, three ecosystems paper interviewed primarily interviewed a bunch of people from those communities okay. why is that a why did they do that what and what else could they have done let's see uh, well, uh, going back to our like, uh, different uh, goals you might have that interviews are very rich that they are going to you know give you answers to questions we haven't even thought of yet uh, if you structure them with some open-ended questions. So they were going in knowing that they don't even know all of the questions they want to ask yet uh, and expecting that they will learn about the norms conversationally with these folks uh, in a way that a more uh, like focused or precise method would not be effective yet. Right, right. Yep. Was that audible at all over Zoom? I've changed the mic, so I have no input on... Uh sound from the room and whether that's picked up at all anybody that's listening if anybody's listening on zoom <laughs> yeah we i could i could get understand what was being said let me i could also try to uh change back to the room mic uh, but let's see let's see if this uh, works please let me know if uh, it gets patchy um thank you what else could they have done is there anything else that you know is, is there any other way they could have uh, done this study uh, using different research methods. We could have also done an observational study very similar to the other one. We could have pulled all of this code and 
tried to build everything in three different languages and different build systems. It would have been a lot of work. And I think it would have been less effective to ask them, like, answer their question. But they could have answered that way. Could they, though? Could they? Does everybody agree with this? I, I would say I probably would have asked different questions if they used that method. I think one another qualitative approach that might give you insight into some of these questions is looking at the like discussions and other metadata associated with open source projects, um, because that it wouldn't really tell you what's going on inside people's heads, but it would tell you what they're saying to other people. Uh -huh, and yeah. That's valuable. Yeah, so I think the, the comment in the room was, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe looking at the code is not the best idea, sorry, the, the best approach to get at people's beliefs and values, because maybe, you know, the code is too technical an artifact and it doesn't embody any of these, uh, but maybe, you know, instead of interviewing them directly, you could have somehow made inferences about their beliefs and values by uh, analyzing some other form of communication or traces that they left behind, like, I don't know, their, uh, I don't know, blog posts or uh, e email messages or whatever, you know, Slack communication, et cetera. So I, I agree, that's, that's a good point. Any, any other way they could have done this? Anybody think of anything else? MRI study. <laughs> MRI study. I don't know if the technology uh, technology is precise enough to get at you know beliefs and values. I don't know if we could do that just yet. May maybe at some point, but that sounds worse <laughs> in terms of uh, you know complexity of actually doing the study. We talked about yeah. yeah. I mean, you can do a survey too, but I, I think it has different limitations than what they're looking for in this case. You know, you can have a lot of. Uh, breadth of survey, you can survey a lot of people in a short amount of time, but you only have those six questions. You can't really have that interview back and forth or really even score during the conversation. So I think the interview is probably a good technique. Right, so the, the comment was in the room was you could do a survey, but maybe uh, you would get less rich answers because you would not get an opportunity to follow up when there was something interesting that the people said. Yeah, so I agree. Uh, I guess an ethnography of sorts too, um, you know, you could, uh, shadow these practitioners somehow and uh, you know observe their actions and you know maybe combine that with some interviews or something else and, and arrive at these inferences yeah i just thought of another one and i don't think we've missed it in the class but like a journal study you get you sort of people to journal about their experience over some time and that could be analyzed like an ethnography or it could be analyzed like through coding or something like that yeah interesting yeah that's so the comment was, you can get people to journal and, and then share those write-ups with you, those journal entries. That's a really nice idea. Um, we should think more about how to do this because you would save on transcription and interviewing. It's a, would... the one example I know for computing context is um, a study where they looked at authentication events and had people basically log on a smartwatch when they authenticated during the day, and then at the end of the day, they would journal about it. Yeah, that makes sense. I've seen one with the Apple Watches. They gave people Apple Watches to wear for some period of time, and I don't know, those, there were pop-ups on the Apple Watches asking them for random information at random times. Okay, uh, thanks. So that was, that was a lot of useful stuff. But, uh, what was the second paper? How did they do what they did? Like what's a huge advantage, arguably, of this analysis of pre-existing data that uh, the authors of the second paper chose to do? It's, it's less rich, but you have more sample size. You can sort of extract more, extract patterns and be more confident in patterns that can be used. Okay, yeah, thank you. That's good. I agree with this. So the answer was, you know, maybe it's less rich because maybe there's not, uh, maybe you won't find data on all of these interesting things that you care about. Um, but you probably will find a lot more data on the, the other things uh, than you could ever get through something like an interview study, just because you can only interview so many people before you burn out.
Um, you don't have to worry about the researchers coding uh, like you did the interview study. In this case, it's a pretty easy to get binary variable and do these things point or not. Okay, yeah. So there's some subjectivity involved in uh, the qualitative analysis, and this is more objective, as I guess the comment. Okay. Um, okay. So that's good. So what are some of the, uh, I sort of took this list uh, that you see here uh, as a rough summary of all the things I read in your discussion posts. But I saw uh, when, when you commented on the possible uh, limitations or issues to consider when it comes to the validity of these studies, um, I saw some of these things. So when it came to the interview study, uh, people mentioned, you know, uh, trick parts of this are finding the right participants to interview in the first place and asking them questions in a somehow neutral, unbiased way that, you know, extracts as, as much of the, their own beliefs and whatnot as possible uh, and as little of yours, as little of your own, you know, biases and, and so on. Um, and both of these are, I agree with these, and these are really hard to do. Um, so for example, you know, if you say only interview your friends or colleagues who happen to work on the same floor as you, because you know, it's easy to find them this way, you ran into them at the coffee machine. Uh, if all you interview is your friends, you probably, you probably get a very different perspective, right? You know, on their experiences. Then if you interview a different sample of people. And so, you know, this is one of the hard things with this is deciding who to, who to talk to in the first place and, and why you select them. Um, and the other one is about you know, how you might um, bias them towards things you want to hear, you know, based on the way you ask these questions. I'll come back with lots more examples later uh, of these kind of anchoring biases and all kinds of other biases that occur in interview and, and survey questions and maybe ways to avoid them. But for example, it would be very easy. Uh, let, me, let me try to give you an example. So let's say I'm asking you to uh, estimate how long, how many hours a week uh, working on the research project for empirical methods would take you. Uh, and I give, you know, I, I give you some information. If I tell you, uh, you know, uh, students that took the class last time told me that it, it took them about 20 hours a week to work on their project. You know, how long do you think it will take you to work on the project? If we do this experiment, right? So I, you know, half of you, I give this prompt and ask this question. The other half of you, I give a different prompt. I tell them, I tell you, you know, students that took the class last a uh, year uh, says they spend about two hours a week working on their research projects for the class. So how long do you think it will take you? Like, what do you expect will happen in, in terms of the answers you give me? Yeah. Uh, doesn't, it, doesn't the anchoring bias apply even if you don't say, like, even if you're not giving something that you present as evidence, like, even if instead of saying students last time took about this time, what do you think? If you just say, like, do you think the amount of time will be given that are less than 20 hours? And you don't say what happened. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that's also true. Um, so yeah, the, the anchoring bias manifests in a variety of ways, and you don't necessarily need, you know, this anchoring point the way I described it. So this also happens in other scenarios. Yes. Yeah, so I'll have a lot more examples of, you know, these kinds of pitfalls later on when we talk about surveys and interviews. Uh, but just something to, you know, something to keep in mind. That's something that's always hard with this kind of work. Um, what about the other paper? Uh, what are you know, things that can go wrong with the I don't know, data mining and statistics approach? I guess the data set itself could be fundamentally flawed. So if you if the data set you collect is more data set of opinions, that's not representative of the overall data set. Then any results that or any conclusions you draw from the data set you may not reflect the um, the reality of the, the overall population. Right. So one thing is, you know, can you actually trust this data to uh, 
reflect what you think it does? And to what extent can you actually trust this data? Because you didn't create it yourself, right? It's something that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, who knows how this was created in the first place? Who knows how it was computed? Can you actually trust, you know, e even if all you do to extract it and pre-process it and aggregate it and whatnot, even if all of that is perfect, but by the way, you should also question that. Um, but then, you know, also the data itself, does it actually you know, reflect what you think it does? Um, anything else? Um, I'll just throw out a very similar but kind of related point is that uh, the processes that we are getting samples from may not be stationary. So if you are pulling in really old historical data, even if it is from the actual like group that you're trying to model, they might have changed their practices over time and you might uh, end up drawing conclusions that no longer apply. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. So the comment is, you know, the context when that data was created uh, in the first place is really relevant and important. And so you have to keep that in mind. It might be that things that you observed uh, to be true at some point no, no longer hold. Yeah, I agree with that too. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Analytical, however they're processing the data, if the analytical technique overlooks something important, then um, it may fundamentally change the answers to the questions. It may not, but it, it, it could, depending on what is overlooked. Yeah, well, you know, what, are, what if they, there's some important confound that the researchers did not account for somehow? You know, what if the uh, association they are detecting is really not at all reflective of some underlying uh, causal relationship, or it's just completely off because of some other variables that were, you know, confounding this. And you know, maybe they haven't observed or accounted for those. Like all kinds, all kinds of things. We can spend a lot of time, um, you know, going over these, and we will when we go to when we get to the more quantitative part of the class. So all kinds of things in the analysis that that could have gone wrong. Um, okay. So now let me let me touch on a couple of things that I saw in your. Uh, comments that I thought were uh, really interesting and worth discussing. So um, one one comment to the quantitative analysis paper was that you know maybe maybe I don't trust the results because this method of measuring whatever x um, isn't entirely perfect, right? Maybe there's some noise in the measurement itself. You know how can I then trust any of the conclusions derived from analyzing this potentially noisy data in the first place. Does that, do you agree with this? Does, does everybody that has sort of thought about this uh, agree with this? And if not, you know, why not? Like, can you think, yeah. I think depending on how you make your conclusions is whether or not you can say that you trust them because I think the authors of this paper on this front in specific did a pretty good job of saying their method of identifying a breaking change has some flaws. They were simplifying it a little bit, um, but they made that very clear um, in their weaknesses section. Or, and then in their conclusions, they also, I think they did a good job of not overgeneralizing the statements they're trying to make on that front. Can you so okay so you know maybe the authors were careful with not overclaiming um, and so describing this limitation. But I want to question. I want to challenge you a little bit. Like, can you think of any scenario where you could still and, and you know not by chance? I guess that's always a, a possibility. But can you think of a scenario where you can arrive at valid conclusions? That you know reflects some true underlying phenomena, et cetera, et cetera, um, from imperfect measurements uh, all over a large sample of uh, I don't know individuals or what have you. Yes. I mean, the immediate if someone that's like privacy related stuff. The immediate example is we intentionally add noise to some types of data in order to not obfuscate individuals. So it's not necessarily 
well, it's more like, what is the noise? Is it giving you like completely opposite answers in some cases? Is it, is it consistent? So in this case, it was, they, it is consistent that it does not detect these sorts of things. So it's not like you're gonna get some random, random breaking changes that don't, it, it's well-defined scope, I guess is what I'm saying. So uh, that would be sort of my response. Yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. I really, this is what I was trying to get at. This is a, you know, one of the you know, million dollar uh, ideas or insights when it comes to, I don't know, data mining style research or quantitative empirical research. Like one of the million dollar ideas is um, all measurements will ultimately be imperfect to some degree, um, but this is really only a problem if they are differently imperfect for different subsets of your population or your sample. Okay, so if, if you know, if say I'm trying to do some analysis of your human height of the people in this class, right? Um, and you know, if I add some random you know, a few inches or subtract some random few inches uh, uniformly to everybody, right? I could still, you know, arrive at valid, valid conclusions if I'm say comparing the height of people wearing blue shirts and hoodies to the height of people wearing gray shirts and hoodies. Right, because I've sort of, you know, perturbed. <laughs> What? I was just saying that's a pretty accurate description of what we're wearing. That, that's pretty, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sharp like this. It's a blue. But he's an outlier anyway, so, you know, because he's so tall. <laughs> he'd probably be removed from the analysis. No, but so, so seriously, it's like this is a really important point that I, that I really want to, I want to stick with you. I, I want you to, to you know, take this home and remember this. You know, if, it, if you have bandwidth for just a couple of bits of insight from today's class, this is an important one to remember, right? This idea that, you know, even noisy data can lead to valid analyses and conclusions if you don't have a good reason to suspect that the noise biases, you know, your conclusions in some particular way. Uh, and this is often an argument we're making, you know, when we're doing this kind of big data research. Right, so, you know, uh, let's say we are, I don't know, this, I, I won't go into this. this, it will take too long. There's lots of examples of things that we do in my group that use large scale analyses of data. Um, and we often argue that these are still valid uh, conclusions and analyses, even though the data may be noisy to some extent or only a proxy for the actual constructs that you're trying to measure, which is always the case. Right, so, you know, speaking of proxies, right, maybe, you know, maybe gray sh shirt people are taller on average than blue shirt people. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm using shirt color as a proxy for human height. It's an imperfect measurement. It's, always, it's only a proxy, but it might still lead to a valid conclusion about you know, average height differences between the two groups. So that's sort of the point. Okay. Um, okay, so another big important thing that came up in uh, uh, comments to the other paper, the ecosystems paper was, uh, to what extent are the opinions of the people that were interviewed, that were sampled, to what extent are those representative of everyone? Okay, so I saw this, I think, more than once in your comments. Um, and does anybody disagree that this is a problem? It is kind of a problem, but it's, I don't think it's, um avoidable problem unless you sample every developer. But as your sample size increases, if you see consistency among um, the responses from people in a certain group, uh, that should increase your confidence that your results are 
I guess what I'm asking, see, I agree with that, but I guess what I'm asking is, why do we always want all of these findings to be generalizable, to apply to everyone? Like, why do we do that, or, or do we? Right, so the, there's a built-in assumption here in this comment, or in this question, there's a built-in assumption that findings, insights, need be generalizable need be applicable universally, right? The assumption is that local things are not as valuable somehow. Because it makes life easier. Like if you actually only believe that it was generalizable to what it is actually generalizable to, then if someone else is cited your paper and you just like, I don't know, like looked at this ecosystem and you were like, oh, well, like in this ecosystem, like they don't follow versioning, whatever, like naming versioning thing. And like they were doing, you know, a different study where they were studying name versioning, but it was on a different ecosystem or something, then there's just like less of a connection. And it's like people just want to be able to generalize because we can't actually study everybody, but we want to be able to study everybody. This is a really good point. So the, let me comment on the last thing you said. We uh don't actually want to or we can't actually study everybody but you know often we want to make claims that apply to anybody yeah we want to be like oh well like developers tend to disengage because they switch jobs even if we only study 25 developers from this community we want to be able to say that so then someone else who's studying disengagement can say well this paper found that developers tend to disengage because of this Okay, okay, so so uh, I agree with this. We don't, a lot of the times we want to um, make these universal claims that apply to the whole world. Um, I, I agree with this, and I, actually I'll come back to this in a second. Uh, but at the same time, I'm asking, you know, are there, uh, you know, valid scenarios in which we're actually content with just understanding, you know, the, uh, small uh, sample of the world that we're looking at. Oops. Do you have, do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, a lot of times research that is not generalizable can be useful in a sort of cumulative case that looking at a lot of research together, where if there are consistent findings from different sampling methods, they may be useful together. But more so than that, like even if it's not generalizable, it may reflect examples of how people think. Um, so particularly, you may not be able to say, this is why everybody does this, but you could say, this is why at least some people do this. Uh -huh. And so that's valuable for that reason. Yeah, and you know, remember, yeah, go ahead. Plus. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the skepticism, which is like that we're asking why, like uh, how representative of this group is like, it's dependent on the conclusions that you're making, right? You don't want to take a conclusion that could potentially be flawed if you generalized it uh, without at least like thinking about the possibility that you were zoning in on a particular group and you were um, you know at least thinking about the factors that might contribute to the results that you saw. But I think on its own, like uh, having a specific group like is valuable. Like getting conclusions on a specific group is valuable on its own. Like as long as you don't, I don't know draw conclusions that you, you don't like try to generalize for the sake of generalizing. I see, okay, yeah. So, you know, if if, if the authors are not trying to make more uh, universal claims, then, you know, we can be perfectly happy with studies like these, right? If, you know, if there's some reason to care about the population they studied or the ecosystem or the community or the context they studied, I mean, so, you know, Think, for example, of uh, marginalized groups in society, right? So, you know, they're by definition not representative of the majority of the population, right? But, you know, they're arguably very important to study and whatnot, you know, help, right? So these two objectives are, you know, in a context like that are fundamentally conflicted and sort of impossible to achieve at the same time, right? You know? I was going to also bring up the example that we saw last time where they were looking at communication and coordination in groups of like us, 
people who do surgery, surgeons. And that was another example of like, oh, we've studied this topic broadly, but now we want to focus in and interview people and see what happens in this one very specific environment and, and only draw conclusions about that environment. Yeah, right. So, like, you know, I, I, guess, I guess my point is, you know, if we have some good reason to care about that group, right? You know, we, we should not try to uh, generalize every time, right? Uh, you know, if, if it's valuable for reasons one can articulate, you know, to study or whatever, um, help some particular group, then that's perfectly fine, right? Is it is in no way any less worthy, right? Uh, than uh, all the other ones that are more general. Okay, so now let me, uh, what do we do? Yeah, um, one, uh, I'll come back to, let's talk about generality or generalizability for a second. Um, is the is the second study any more or any less? Uh, does it lead to any more or any less generalizable uh, findings or claims compared to the first one and, and why? Yeah. I think the second study is less generalizable because they look at this one data set and I maybe I'm getting hung up on one part of the paper where they talk about this peculiarity of the Maven data set where they're like, there's external packages and internal packages, and they're both just thrown into this one big data set. But internal packages, which are meant only for a developer themselves to use, likely follow completely different versioning standards than an external data set, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you couldn't generalize to other um, repositories which don't have that feature. OK, OK. Yeah, anyone else? Thank you. Yep. I, I think it demand, depends on the axis on which you want to generalize that the Maven study might be more generalizable among, I'm just going to throw an axis of time or something, uh, or, and maybe the other one is more generalizable that, oh, we looked at three communities. So maybe if you were to pick a fourth community, it'd be more likely to match what you saw in the first study than what you would see just in Maven. Uh -huh. I think there's many dimensions of generalizability. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree with that too. There's many dimensions to generalizability. You know, you, when you're making claims about does this apply more broadly than where I observed it, you want to think also about the you know, particular dimension on, on which you are claiming it applies. Anyone else? Anything else? Yep. One thing I brought up in my comment is that I think both of these provide bases for forming hypotheses about other things. I don't think you can necessarily say because they found this without other literature. In general, I think most of the time you should consider things in light of other literature. But um, yeah, it's useful for forming hypotheses if something is comparable. Okay, great. So let's, this is, we're getting to the second bit of uh, nugget of valuable uh, knowledge to take home with you after today's class. Um, there are, I claim, uh, two ways fundamentally in which one can generalize some results uh, from some sample to the overall population. Um, what are they? Let's try, is anybody on Zoom awake? and willing to answer this. Yes, the question is, I claim there are two fundamental ways to generalize some claims beyond the particular sample where you've observed them or made them or are confident uh, about them. Two fundamental ways to generalize, what are they? Somebody that is awake, you, that is not. Yeah, I guess. You could, here's, uh, you could talk, you could spend time talking about how um, your sample truly represents everyone or everything, and that the results you got in the way you tested them were 
wildly consistent across like a very diverse sample. Therefore, it's you've you've tested everything and it's always the same. I don't know. Okay, that would yeah, be one great. generalizable way. Looking at your arguing that your sample is perfectly representative of everything. Cool. So I guess there's three ways. I stand corrected. <laughs> the, except the third way is arguably really annoying. The third, <laughs> the third way, the third way is you go and you test it again everywhere else until you've exhaustedly tested it everywhere and you're confident that it holds. Right. So th th that was part of your answer, uh, not the whole answer. Let me uh, let me touch on the other part too. But this was part of it. it, it you know, and I I guess I wasn't really thinking of this because it's annoying, right? You have to like go and redo all of this. I don't know, study everywhere else. Uh, the other part of your answer was, uh, I think, touching on what I had in mind. You said, you know, you argue, you said you argue somehow that the finding applies elsewhere too. So this is true. This is one of the, one of the two that I had in mind originally. Um, uh, people talk or uh, refer to this as analytical general, generalization. Uh, you're doing it analytically, meaning you're uh, arguing analytically uh, about the mechanism uh, and you know the fundamental cause and effects and on all of those the underlying mechanisms that have led you to observe that effect in the first place and how those apply also in these other contexts and maybe don't apply in those other contexts but in all the contexts where all of the relevant variables match the uh, you know the environment where you observed the thing you can be confident you can expect theoretically analytically you can expect the same effect to also hold. And obviously you can go and test it, right? There's nothing stopping you from doing this, but at least you can so expect it analytically. You would expect that, you know, it would also hold on this other um, uh, sample, uh, right? Be because you have this theoretical understanding of the underlying mechanism that uh, caused that thing in the first place. I always give this example of, um, uh, sailors and uh, I don't know some war in the 1700s that were dying of scurvy um, and uh, they had figured out that they can prevent them from dying if they feed them. so they're out at sea on these boats uh, they figured out they could prevent them from dying if they feed them I don't know lemons and oranges because those have uh, a lot of vitamin c in them and uh, you know it's really a vitamin c deficiency that causes scurvy in the first place and as long as you can correct it, you know, you're fine, right? So if you have this understanding of the underlying mechanism through which that effect is created, right? Then you can expect it to also hold everywhere else where, you know, there's a vitamin C deficiency in humans because you understand the mechanism. Yes. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking, is this like an empirical methodology or is this just like, Logically, it is because, um, you know, because it. Uh, so the question in the room was, to, how does this relate to research methods? I guess um, the answer is, um, this is what we sometimes refer to as theory when we talk about empirical studies, right? So you know, we talked about the two philosophical worldviews. One is the social constructivist where you build theory from the ground up. Uh, the other one was this, uh, I don't know, inductive, uh, objectivist, thank you, where you start from some, I don't know, theory and you test hypotheses from, from it in, in different contexts. So, you know, I guess the point is there is some theory, right, that explains this mechanism. When you build a theory and then you argue that Yes, you build a theory if it doesn't exist, uh, and then you can go and replicate it and test it in other environments just to confirm it or to refine it, right? Maybe you were wrong in, the, you know, in your first formulation of the theory, uh, or maybe it exists and it's so, I don't know, uh, widely uh, accepted in other domains that you believe it, but then you know, maybe you just have some specific hypotheses and you test it, you know, whatever it might be, but that's, that's where it fits in. It informs your hypotheses and research questions. 
Uh, okay, so that's one. One is the, I don't know, the analytical way. The other one, anybody on Zoom know what the other one is? Way too generalized. Should we pick on Madeline again since Madeline was awake earlier? I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know. OK, so anybody here? Courtney? Uh, sample, like a sufficiently large, randomly selected sample? Yes. The other way is through statistical sampling. Okay. So, you know, think of all of the, I don't know, election polling and things like that, right? Uh, when, uh, I don't know, pollsters ask people who they are likely to vote for in the upcoming election, they don't ask every single registered voter in the country, right? They actually, they ask relatively very few people. So when you, like, uh, when you do this random sampling, did you also have to essentially prove that your sample is representative of the distribution that you're Yes. And I would say to that point, a lot of times pollsters have to make a lot of effort to reach people like who don't have access to the internet or live in like really impoverished areas in order to make sure that they're actually reaching the entire population uh -huh. or represent the entire population. Yeah, that's a great point. Because often the way you sample is limited technologically, but you just don't have a way of sampling purely randomly. Um, but yeah, so this is the other way. So really the, the second nugget of useful life knowledge from today is this, right? There's fundamentally two, I guess three, if we count the annoying one, two ways to uh, generalize conclusions beyond the specific context where they've been drawn. Right, these, these are fundamentally the two. Any, any paper that you will ever see anywhere, right, that tries to make claims of generality has to make one of these two arguments. There's no other way. But I guess arguably also the third one can be reduced to the, I don't know, the first one where you have some hypotheses and theory and you go and test it elsewhere. Right, so th think about this, right? When you see any paper that tries to make claims. So, so here, for example, you know, does the finding from the Maven ecosystem hold universally? We don't know. It might, it might just as well, it might hold. But, you know, the second paper that suggests there's a, uh, an association between people's values and these practices, and that people's values tend to differ across these communities, you know, that would probably suggest that you won't find the same Maven effect elsewhere uh, in the same way. Uh, because really the effect is maybe caused by these underlying beliefs and values. Uh, and, you know, those are, have been shown to differ empirically. So, you know, therefore also you can expect the effect to vary uh, across these contexts. So, you know, in that sense, in that sense, I agree. Somebody said this earlier uh, that probably the three ecosystem study leads to maybe more generalizable knowledge or findings because it tries to get at this underlying mechanism more than the other one, right? So that, therefore, you know, you can apply this uh, analytical reasoning to see where else that mechanism you know, is present. Okay. Uh, and so one more thing, there was this super interesting quote that I pulled from one of your comments. I thought this was really, it reminded me of the uh, anecdotal evidence uh, guy from the beginning of class. Um, so I'm inclined to trust the results as they broadly align with my own anecdotal uh, evidence or beliefs. Um, this was uh, super good because I think it's entirely true. I, 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 I believe this entirely. Um, and this is also exactly what you see uh, on the one hand, you know, uh, with all of this uh, political polarization that happens on social media and so on, uh, uh, people are more likely to believe the things that align with their pre-existing views. There's lots and lots of studies on, on this. Um, but also, uh, 
uh, when it comes to science and publications and peer review, you will often find that you know, there is this well-documented, I'll, I'll send some references, well-documented bias in science in general, not just computer science, um, uh, towards things that reviewers, right, who are the ultimate shepherds of science, uh, things they find intuitive and against uh, things that are not intuitive, but also at the same time, results that are more surprising are more likely to get published compared to results that are, uh, you know, that, that confirm something that people already you know, found to, uh, to be intuitive, right? So the, the key to become famous is to publish something surprising that contradicts, you know, uh, people's anecdotal beliefs. Uh, yeah. It still convinces the reviewers that it's true. It still convinces the reviewers that it's true, which is a high bar. Because I think some reviewers are still doing the same thing with anecdotal evidence. Some of them don't even read traditions. Yeah, so I thought this was really interesting, um, you know, because I, uh, I guess, I guess what I'm hoping to uh teach you by the end of this class is not to believe things that are at least not so much believe things that you happen to agree with or that you find intuitive but instead to believe things that were uh presented with sufficient evidence supporting them and i want you to be able to you know, question that evidence uh, and draw these conclusions more objectively, right? Rather than defaulting to this, you know, human bias that we all share to just um, believe that things that happen to align with your uh, worldviews. Okay, so that was readings. I guess we are, uh, we're about uh, out of time here. So we won't go over, uh, we're going to change the format a little bit. We we spent too much time. Hopefully, it was interesting, but we spent a lot of time talking about the readings. Um, so the lecture today was initially planned to be about formulating research questions. You know, what is uh, maybe the first pass, arguably more uh, naive way of asking a research question, and what is a more thoughtful, you know, second pass. Uh, on that and how, how do you refine research questions to make them more answerable. Um, I will instead assign some reading uh, where uh, I, you know, I designed this lecture from, um, and I will invite you to look at that uh, offline for Tuesday. Um, and, uh, you know, instead of, instead of, you know, going through this lecture, uh, you know, again on Tuesday, I will maybe have a very short discussion kind of off the reading. Uh, maybe there's going to be a quiz. Bobo? Quiz? Tuesday? Okay. Okay. We'll do a quiz. <laughs> the video from like the last time we taught, there's part of that lecture. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Perfect. Yes. There is a video. Perfect. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. We don't actually need to uh, do that. There is a video, so I will point you to it. It's on the website. <laughs> Uh, but I will, you know, send the link to the video around together with the pointer to the readings uh, and ask you to look at that offline and we'll have some discussion brief as I will, can answer questions, etc. Uh, we'll have a quiz on Tuesday. Uh, the other thing I want to do on Tuesday uh, is have you present at least a couple of example papers that touch on some of these issues we discussed today of theory of generalizability of you know, uh, research questions and how to formulate them. Um, so I will ask for probably two volunteers for Tuesday. I'll send the, an email around uh, after class. Two volunteers for Tuesday to uh, prepare each uh, presentation of some published research paper. Plan for something like 10 minutes where you uh, summarize the paper to the rest of us uh, you know, explain the main points, et cetera, describe the methodology, some of the findings, 
then we can talk a bit about the dissecting the research design uh, of those two papers. So if you feel so inclined, this is one of those opportunities where this will count towards one of those, you know, sign up things. Um, uh, and you can do that offline. You don't have to do that. I'll send that around. You. No, I, I will, I'll send the, I, I will choose the papers um, just to make it easier. Yeah, yeah. I, I have stuff in mind. Uh, I'm just looking for probably two volunteers that are willing to, uh, Put some time into preparing a 10 minute presentation each for Tuesday in class. All right, so let me stop here because we're kind of on time. Um, and I'm happy to take more questions while we're wrapping up.